War, war never changes. They say war is hell, but hell is filled with the guilty. War claims the guilty and innocent alike. No, war is war. It is here, in the trenches, I write my final will and testament. I also take this time to tell my story. A story of two cups and a string. Communications were limited. We were restricted to visual and shouting distance. The parental overlords disallowed comms devices on either side. We were to play nice, as if. As if I could allow my binky to be stolen by a, a, a human. What next? Will he steal my blankie too? Then my stuffed toys? No, not this time. Perhaps I should have. Perhaps, perhaps I should have surrendered all to the vile General Sean Miller. It would have been far easier. It would have cost me far less. General Miller and his men controlled two far corners of the playroom, but my forces cut an impenetrable line splitting his two sides. Without proper communications, his men can't coordinate. If his men can't coordinate, they would fall apart. I had him dead to rights. His dinosaurs clashed with my robots. Ha! Flesh versus hard steel, not a chance. But he argues. He argues that dinosaurs eat steel. That, that isn't how this works. Iron drills through meat. True. We don't have evidence dinosaurs can't eat steel. Fine. We come to an agreement. We stalemate. While that front is locked in an eternal struggle, I divert my attention to the other side. Great. If my calculations are correct, General Miller's brother, M. and Brandon Miller, is assembling a fleet of Lego starships. I had to act quickly if I was going to keep up a solid defense. Luckily, my natural Encodian engineering skills and quicker speed gave me the advantage. I built my fleet while keeping an eye on General Miller's egress, or lack thereof, into my impenetrable wall on the ground. In no time at all, my Lego ships were ready. I wish it were all sunshine and rainbows from here, but I wouldn't be writing this if that were the case. Sean's little brother proved a more adequate foe. I suppose I should start from the beginning of the battle. The moment we emerged from warp, an explosion rocked the space around me, instantly dooming one of my ships to the gravitational pull of a nearby gas giant. Adrenaline surged through me, my grip on the console tightening. Fortunately, I hadn't been aboard that doomed vessel. Target locked the capital and open fire, I bellowed. My gaze scoured the viewing screen until I located it. I thought it was a planet. It was a massive ball of Legos that surely weighed more than 30 pounds. That thing was too big to maneuver properly. Big mistake. Easy pickings, says I. Sir, we're under target lock by 18. Hmm. 19. 24. 39 vessels and counting, came the voice of my first officer. Launch flares, I commanded, and initiate evasive maneuvers. Less than a minute into the space conflict, half of my smaller ships were lost, and my capital vessel bore grievous wounds thanks to thrown Lego block missiles. No throwing toys, boys, came the voice of the human mother. Mothers never understood war, and what was necessary to execute it. My crew executed my orders without hesitation. I watched as each of them leaned to the right when the cannons discharged. The ship to our port side was decimated by our cannon fire. The lack of a counterbalancing force on our ship's opposite side caused it to creak, groan, and tilt. The maneuver worked, and we burned hot and heavy to disengage from that area of the battlefield. The intense heat from our engines incinerated the remains of the enemy vessel. The sudden, unexpected change in course baffled my pursuing missiles. Lacking the nimble maneuvering capabilities we exploited, they careened off course and punched into the other of Miller's ships, detonating them on impact. Although we escaped the path of his missiles, reaching Brandon's capital remained an impossibility. For now, that is. Our progression was far from assured. 
The sharp turn forced our nose towards the gas giant. Our trajectory led us deeper into enemy territory, and the reddish-orange planet loomed ever larger as we did everything but fight against its pull. Thankfully, speed and power were my game. We darted and veered, leaving human crewed ships trailing behind, our cannons firing relentlessly. In a matter of seconds, we dismantled so many adversaries that I lost count. Despite our speed advantage confounding their targeting, we knew our ammunition would eventually dwindle, and it was only a matter of time before a few good hits landed, and the blocks that made my ship would dislodge. The biggest problem, however, was the growing planet in front of us on the solar system playmat we sat on. The second biggest problem was that some of Miller's fastest ships managed to keep pace. Ships to our port and starboard sides, as well as ship north and ship south, prevented us from veering away. They were trying to force us into a gravitational crash. Our pursuing ships struggled to keep up, but they did, much to my annoyance. Their engines began to glow red-hot, and molten steel started flaking off and vaporized in the exhaust. That was good. But in the ever-approaching atmosphere, their engines would have air exchange to start cooling their bafflings. Rather counterintuitively, space does a poor job at keeping hot things cold, and a medium of matter was needed to disperse heat. Admiral Brandon knew that, and pressed even harder after me. Something to my right caught my eye. General Sean Miller was making his move. Shoreside, General Sean managed to press harder against my wall of robots with G.I. Joe commandos riding on Transformers trucks. Of course, if anyone was going to break through, it's the Transformers. Their speed advantage, as well as their weapons arsenal, proved a challenge, but a manageable one. I just couldn't let the commandos through. No telling what havoc they could wreak. I needed to divert air power to my ground forces. Luckily, I had the ships to spare. Crap. Those aren't Autobots. Those are Decepticons. Decepticons can fly, providing a whole new challenge to my defensive maneuvers. I had to keep the two sides separated. The Decepticons can't be allowed to break the atmosphere. One large carrier should do the trick, and just for good measure, I reached behind me into the toy bin and summoned one of Earth's most horrifying monsters. God frickin' Zilla. It's a logical choice. Godzilla withstands conventional weapons and is a bigger, scarier version of Miller's dinosaurs. Ground forces, watch out, I said to myself with a devious twist in one corner of my smile. I can't let my focus waver too long. The space battle is paramount. My capital was still slave to the gas giant's gravitational pull. Sensing the impending doom, my first officer stood and turned to face me. Whatever happened, sir, it was an honor serving beside you. Back to your station. We aren't done yet, I spat back. I knew interrupting a death speech was dishonorable, but with spite growing ever stronger and the planet growing ever closer, I couldn't afford the time for him to finish. That devious twist never left my smile. It only grew to both sides. Divert energy from shields to inertial dampeners and cut engines. Once this was accomplished, I began a spin. Not some fancy schmancy spin, a useful one. An ugly, wobbly, unbalanced one. One that kept our enemy from tracking which maneuvering thrusters activated and in what sequence. It started off slow. A spin on one axis, then the axis began to destabilize and tilt back and forth. Eventually, we were a blur, as were my numerous arms. They whipped around, smashing controls on my console, but my faster encodian reflexes were able to keep track. I tracked the ground as it moved ahead of us, above us, below us, and finally behind us. Burn hard now. Even with the dampers on maximum, the forces were taking a toll on my biology. 
we initiated another spin using centrifugal force to re-stabilize our axis and keep us headed back away from the planet like a bullet out of a rifled barrel, and we had done it before hitting the atmosphere. With nothing to cool their jets, our pursuers would have to fall back to the atmosphere and hope their engines could recover in air before plummeting to the dense planet core. There was a tense moment of silence after that maneuver. Understandable, my men thought they were going to lose their lives. It would take a moment to recover, but we were still in a battle. This lasted almost ten seconds, an eternity in Encodian time, and I almost gave some meaningless order just to break the tension, but someone spoke before I could. Admiral Jamin, concentrated laser fire on our starboard engine, heat's building up faster than we can dissipate it. Seizing control back from my officer, I attempted evasive maneuvers, but no matter what I did, the laser stayed unwaveringly focused. Against my best arguments, Admiral Brandon Miller said his laser will never lose its target, forcing me to get creative. Find where that laser is coming from, I shouted, then braced as a large chunk of the ship scraped past the bridge, leaving a crack in the viewing screen. Hey, Mum said no throwing, I shouted. In a threatening tone, I heard his mother shout, Brandon, and he relinquished the other damaged vessel in his left hand. In no time, my order was answered. Already done. A holographic map materialized before me, displaying our exact moving location, the laser's origin, and a direct line connecting the two points. The debris field and surrounding ships also appeared on the hologram. Through it, I watched my fleet demolishing the opposition. Stay focused. He can still win if you get sloppy, I reminded myself. I eyed the rest of my fleet carefully. While my loyal sailors lacked a ship as swift as mine, their shields held strong. They can do this. But the real question is, can I? Can I get my capital ship out unscathed? I studied the holographic image of an adjacent enemy vessel, identifying a vulnerable point. I calculated a flight path that would manipulate the laser over the enemy ship and executed it in less than a second. All this was very unlike Admiral Miller. He's being too direct, one tactic at a time. He tried missiles, then he tried to ram me into the planet. Now he's using energy weapons. And the sheer amount of ships at his disposal, something was wrong. It was like he was being fed a constant supply of material to keep building ships. What is he playing at? I had to check back with my ground forces. No, all seems normal. Godzilla was managing everything handily, and my carrier laid down cover from orbit. I was successfully fighting off two humans, and yet something was off. I don't have time for this. One thing at a time. I would have to complete my maneuver before my engines succumbed to overheating. I was overclocking my engines as is, on top of the laser heat. Eventually it would force me into a collision course without the means to adjust. The advantage I did have being targeted by a laser was that it required a minimum time under its beam to cause significant damage. However, the downside was that the laser effortlessly penetrated all energy shielding. Energy penetrates energy, and mass punches through mass. Nevertheless, my ship, my pride and joy, would need a tune-up if she survived this. As Godzilla, I sprayed terrible radiation, turning dinosaurs into wall shadows. Something still felt off. It was like General Sean's heart wasn't in it anymore. And what is this red yarn going across my battlefield? I began to investigate, but remembered my more pressing demands. Not important, I said. Not when my capital is in danger. The vessel quaked and groaned as we banked the force pressing me deeper into my seat. We sailed over the enemy ship, allowing the diligent laser to intersect with the enemy's flight deck's windshield. While I didn't think it would disable the ship, it should bake anyone inside, even if only momentarily. My gaze remained on the hologram as I relinquished control back to my first officer. Moments later, all gunfire from that vessel ceased, escape pods launched, and its course corrections halted.
That laser evidently wielded more power than I had anticipated. The beam must have instantaneously ignited the entire flight deck's atmosphere upon contact with the air. I took a mental note of what the beam could do, and was grateful Miller thought it best to target my heat-resistant engines of all things, rather than my flight deck. The downed ship's momentum maintained its trajectory and I gave the order to follow the path it creates before it's sealed up once again. A thought flickered in my mind, a replayed memory sparking a wild idea. The escape pod's launching inspired me to do something stupid, something only Admiral Miller would think of. Great, I'm beginning to think like a human, I groaned. It could buy us precious time, although it would ultimately leave us devoid of alternative escape options. I weighed the options, then issued the command. We will save escape for the weak. Launch all escape pods and remotely steer to intercept the laser fire. My voice lacked the vigour from earlier, now with a hint of trepidation. Miller was making me second-guess myself. I had to shake the feeling. It might grant us a brief chance to dissipate some of the heat before the pods are destroyed. Once this was done, I maximized our shield output and reduced our engine's output to match the sluggish pace of the battleship. It prevented us from overtaking the massive dead ship ahead of us, but stripped of the safeguard of speed, we didn't have much time. When we finally penetrated the blockade, our shields were riddled with holes. The hull was leaking atmosphere, and the laser fire had managed to liquefy all our escape pods, perforate the engine, and was steadily delving deeper past the bulkheads. Come on, baby. You can do it, I begged. We did it. Now, on the other side of the blockade, with the help of one massive battering ram, all weapons fire came from one direction. I shouted, redirect all shields to our aft flank. Then I saw it our ticket to victory, the flagship. I tilted the holographic image to reveal a throughport on the battleship ahead of us. It looked to be designed to allow smaller fighters to launch from either side, but it could just save me and win me this battle. Leveraging my one functional engine and all remaining maneuvering thrusters, I overtook the behemoth and squeezed into the docking bay. It was a tight squeeze so tight that I managed to scrape off half my small thrusters and some sensors linked directly to the hologram in front of me. My ship barely fit through one end, but after a carefully calculated jump, I didn't have to worry about my exit. I vaulted through the opposite side at warp speed. The exit hole expanded as the ship was torn apart around us, leaving behind a shockwave of shattered battleship debris. The field of shrapnel should dismantle the enemy capital and even take down another ship or two. Carrying the foremost chunk of the broken battleship to Miller's capital, I smashed the two Lego constructions into each other. We destroyed the enemy capital. We had done it. The damage to my ship was extensive. Atmosphere leaked from most ships. Emergency efforts were already underway just to put out fires and prevent rapid decompression. Reports came in from all survivors. Enemy fleet down. Now to focus on General Miller. Wait. Wait. No. He built his own fleet? All this time he wasn't fighting to win. He was fighting to buy time to get a fleet of his own up and running. The Lego box was on his side. It was always on his side. He supplied material to Admiral Miller this whole time. Just enough material to buy time. What's worse, he unleashed a monster. The baby gate was open and the little sister came lumbering forward. She was a force of nature, not something that can be negotiated with. No, no, this isn't fair. How did you coordinate such an assault? Answer me, human. The sister grabbed Godzilla from me and put a Barbie wig on it. No, you can't do this. My robots were destined to join her tea party too. That isn't possible. General Miller's fleet rose and I saw it. A cup to General Miller's mouth and a cup to Admiral Miller's ear. 
Between them red yarn. I didn't have a chance. My forces were too tired from fighting the first fleet, and so now I watch from the tea party table, where imaginary tea is poured, and I am to pretend to drink. I watch as my fleet is dismantled, jumped up and down on, and humiliated by a simple line of communication. A cup and a string.